This is um, session four, but episode three of supercomputing in plain English. This is instruction level parallelism. So up till now, we've been talking about the storage hierarchy, but I promised you the two things that supercomputing is concerned about, the storage hierarchy and parallelism. And most of the rest of this semester is gonna be about parallelism because there's so much good stuff in the world of parallelism. So let's learn all about it. Oh, it's an experiment. So all of this will of course fail. Uh, if you are on something where you can mute yourself, do mute yourself. Um, download the slides. So if anything goes wrong, you still have that. I'm gonna recommend if you are on YouTube or Twitch or what have you, um, or Wowza, I'm gonna recommend give Zoom a try because I think the audio quality is gonna be there, better there. The video quality may be better there. Um, and also that way we can track the numbers that we can brag to the National Science Foundation. And I know you think I'd be silly when I say that, but as it turns out, I've got a grant proposal due tomorrow at five where I have extensive brags, including about supercomputing in plain English this semester. So um, I'm not kidding. If you are going to YouTube, search for supercomputing and then in plain English is all one word. There's Twitch, Wowza, blah, 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 blah. We have the phone bridge. Don't go there unless you need to. Mute yourself. Um, send your questions to supercomputing in plain English, all one word, at gmail.com. Debbie will cheerfully read them out for us. Um, if you're in the room and you haven't yet signed a talent release form, you have to do that. Um, I did adjust the schedule so we know what's going on. Uh, so we've got instruction level parallelism this week, and then we'll get to stupid compiler tricks next week. Um, which is a name that no longer resonates because, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? The stupid compiler tricks guy. Dave Letterman is no longer on TV a lot. So he's the guy who used to do stupid compiler tricks. Anyway, thank you to all the people who have been helping. Um, it's fantastic. It is a team effort. And of course, again, everything will fail. Lots of fun stuff coming up. Make sure to participate. All right. So what are we going to talk about? We'll talk about what it means instruction level parallelism. Um, and we'll look at various kinds of instruction level parallelism. And I'll try to provide some real examples where I've actually tested stuff to show you that I'm not kidding. All right, so thinking back to our very first session, the overview session, what is parallelism? What did I say that parallelism is? Go ahead. Doing multiple things at the same time. Doing multiple things at the same time. That is exactly correct. And I had this example of, you know, your. Uh, watching TV while listening to music, while doing your homework, while reading a book, while texting a friend, right? So when you're doing that, you're not literally doing all of those at the same moment. You're switching your attention from one to the other. That's not parallelism. That's actually called concurrency. Parallelism is the subset of concurrency where you're literally doing everything in the same moment at the exact same time. So here's kind of the example that we used. If I go to Bass Pro Shop and I buy, you know, the, the most expensive fishing pole and the most expensive fishing line and the most expensive fish hooks, and I go out to the lake, and you and 99 of your best friends get broomsticks and bailing twine and bent paper clips, and the hundred of you go to the lake, no matter how hard I fish, the hundred of you are going to bring home more fish than me. My amazing gear is always going to be crushed by a large amount of cheap junk. Okay. All right, so what's instruction level parallelism? Instruction level parallelism is doing parallelism inside a single CPU core, okay? Now, much of the parallelism that we're gonna be talking about this semester is using multiple cores at the same time. We'll talk about using multiple cores in the same um, PC, in the same box. We'll talk about using multiple boxes together. But today, we're going to talk about in a single CPU core, a single brain of a multi-core CPU, we still have a lot of parallelism that we can get. Okay? So the deal is that CPU comes with a lot of circuitry that many engineers have worked very, very hard to design and implement. And those engineers want your code to run as fast as possible. Why do the engineers want your code? To, why do they care about you? Why is it important to them that your code runs fast? I promise it's not out of the goodness of their heart. What do they want? They want money. And if your code runs fast on their CPU, what will you do? Give them money. 
you will give them money in exchange for their CPUs. Exactly correct. Good. So um, one of the things they realized fairly early on was, hey, we've got all this circuitry inside the CPU. Why don't we see if we can get as much of it as possible to be doing stuff as often as possible? Because then your code will run faster and you will buy more of our chips, right? Again, it's not out of the goodness of their heart that they're doing this. It's because they want to eat and put a roof over their heads, right? Very important. So what they want is to have the all, as much of that circuitry active at, at a time as they possibly can. So if you can have a CPU, a CPU core, that's working on 10 operations at a time, then at least in principle, that's gonna be 10 times as fast as a CPU core that can only do one at a time, okay? All right, now, should you panic? According to the slide, I promise to tell you when to panic. Okay, so here's the thing. What we're gonna get into is gonna be a bit complicated and it's actually even more complicated than the complicated that I'm gonna show you. But you don't have to do this in your code. You have to be aware of this so that you can tailor your code to make it easy for the combination of the compiler and the hardware to do things fast. Your job is not to write instruction level parallelism. Your job is to write code that the compiler can do instruction level parallelism for. It's actually a, compi a combination of the compiler and the hardware. Um, there has been hardware um, that it's only the compiler and the hardware just does what the executable says. But most CPU families today, it's the two working together, the compiler and then the hardware makes decisions on the fly in order to get the best possible speed up. So we're gonna look at four flavors of instruction level parallelism. Super scalar means I'm gonna have multiple different things going on at the same time. Pipelining means I'm going to take a series of actions that are the same action on different data and I'm gonna break them down into stages and I'm going to do each of those stages with different data at the same time. So this will be like an assembly line, like a bucket brigade Everybody is doing the same thing over and over, but with different pieces of data. Super pipeline is where I'm gonna have multiple pipelines going on at the same time. So it's a combination of super scalar pipeline. And then vector is where I'm gonna actually have hardware that's designed to work on multiple pieces of data, doing the same operation on multiple pieces of data at the same time, okay? All right, so in order to talk about this, we have to talk about what we mean by an instruction. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but um, the most common kinds of instructions are memory instructions. So loading data from RAM, storing data into RAM. Arithmetic instructions like adding, subtracting, multiplying. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, different instructions take different amounts of time to do, which becomes very important. Logical instructions like and, or, and not. Um, and then branching, which means going from here to there in the list of the instructions. Um, so how many of you have written code before? Okay, so when you write code, have you done things like if? How many of you have done if? Okay, how many of you have done go to? Okay, stop it. Okay, there, there, there's actually a paper, a famous paper from the 1970s, no less, called go to seen as harmful. And they explain very carefully, one of the greatest computer scientists in history explains very carefully why you should not use GoTo. Okay. Um, all right, now, a little bit of jargon. Um, we're gonna use a term clock cycle. You'll also hear me say cycle or even you'll hear people say clock, okay? Clock cycle. So how many of you have heard a CPU referred to as so many gigahertz, like a 2.5 gigahertz CPU, okay? So what does that mean? It means, that there's an actual clock, and it, think of it as morally equivalent to, how many of you have ever had a quartz clock? Right? So a quartz clock, as opposed to like Swiss movement. A Swiss movement clock is all little tiny metal gears, right? But a quartz clock, there's a little tiny quartz crystal inside the clock, and it vibrates at a fixed frequency. And if it vibrates enough times, that adds up to a second, and then the second hand clicks forward, right? And, 
more times, 60 more of those, and you get a full minute and so on. Okay? So there's an equivalent thing inside the CPU that vibrates at a fixed frequency. Okay? Um, and that fixed frequency these days is usually between about one and a half and about 3.8 gigahertz. You rarely see a four gigahertz chip these days. Um, but um, if you've got, say, a two gigahertz chip, that means that the little thing inside vibrates two billion times a second. The reason that that's important is that every operation, every instruction takes a certain number of cycles to execute. Okay? So, um, and I've got some numbers to show concretely for this particular kind of operation, it takes this many cycles to do on this particular flavor of chip. And by the way, they have gotten better and better so the number of cycles it takes to do at least certain operations has come down. Other operations, not so much. Okay. All right. So to give you some concrete examples, let's take a look at, this is a slightly older version of the x86 chips. Intel Sandy Bridge was a 2012 vintage for the server version. So to add two numbers together that are already in registers, to add those numbers together takes three cycles. Likewise, subtract, multiply was five, look at this, divide, 21 to 45 cycles, square root the same, tangent up to 300 cycles. Um, I didn't list it here, but typically the worst instruction in terms of the number of cycles it takes to execute is raise real x to the real y power. Okay? x to the y power, where both of those are non-integers, takes an enormous amount of time. It's usually the slowest operation. Um, and we can see similar from um, other chip families and so on. All right, so scalar operation, don't panic. Scalar operation. So here's a statement. Um, you could say that this is either in C, C++, Java, or Fortran 90, but not Fortran 77, because Fortran 77 wouldn't have a semicolon. You could use the semicolon in Fortran 90, although most people don't bother. Um, so Z is assigned A times B plus C times B, right? So what am I going to do first? What now? What should I choose to do? Okay, mathematically, what would I do first? In, in, if I was doing this by hand with pencil and paper, what would I do? I'd multiply, what would I multiply? Why would I multiply A times B first? By the way, I totally agree. But why would I do that? Anybody remember the mnemonic for this? PEMDAS, yes! Okay, P-E-M-D-A-S, so parentheses, which there aren't any here, um, exponentiation, x to the y power, which there isn't any here, uh, multiply and divide, that's the MD, um, and those in math you're supposed to do um, just left to right, and then AS, add and subtract, again left to right, okay? So that's the order of operations or order of precedence or order of priority for how we do the calculations. Now, in order to multiply A times B, what must I already know? A and B. So what I'm going to have to do, now A and B in a computer program, where do they live? They live out in RAM. So I'm going to have to go load them from RAM into some register. I've left out all of the complexity associated with cache because the instruction doesn't care about that. That's all magically automatic. But let's just think of it as we're going to load from the memory location, the memory address associated with the name A into register, let's call it register zero. It doesn't really matter what register it is. All right, we'll load B into a, some other register. Let's call it register one. So far so good. Now we can go ahead and do our multiply. So register two is going to get register zero times register one. So far so good. Okay. Now we're going to multiply C times D. So we load C into register. Let's say it's R3. We load D into R4. We multiply those. Everything's going great. Now we can add. So we take what's in register two, which is that first product. And we can take what's in register five, which is our second product. And we add those together to the result in R6. And then we're done. We've got our value for Z. So we can store it out into RAM where Z lives. Okay? And that's literally what happens, except that it's not. This is, in principle, what ought to happen. Right? The reality is, this is too slow. So how long does it take to do this? Well, um, let's count the number of operations we have. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight operations. Now, by the way, I've super oversimplified this because I'm pretending that load and store take the same time, the amount of time as add and multiply, which is totally not true at all, not even close. But let's pretend for simplicity. All right, so does it matter whether I multiply A times B first or C times D first? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No, it doesn't matter at all. I can do them in either order, right? Okay. So instead of doing A and B, I could start with, ooh, I did D and C. Does it matter whether I multiply C times D or D times C? Why not? What's that magical word that we learned in math class about what multiplication and addition are? They are commutative, which means the order doesn't matter, right? Okay. So um, I could do D times C or C times D, and I could do this sub-expression first or that sub-expression first. It doesn't matter. So far so good? Okay. Could I do the add first? Shake your head louder with no. no. No, I couldn't. No, I have to multiply. I have to do both multiplies first before I can get around to doing the add. So there is a dependency between the add and the multiplies. The add cannot happen until the multiplies are both complete. Do we agree on that? Okay. So far so good? So we agree that the order doesn't matter because addition and multiplication are commutative. So far so good? Okay. So suppose order doesn't matter. Is one of the legal orders, since order doesn't matter, is one of the orders we're allowed to use at the same time? Can I multiply A times B at the same time as I multiply B, C times D. Will that change the result? It won't change the result, so can I do it? Yeah, so I can, so check this out. Let's say I do two loads at the same time. I'll load A and B at the same time. And by the way, some CPUs can do multiple loads from memory at the same time, okay. Um, then I could be multiplying while I'm doing the other load. Now, if I have a CPU that can do four loads at one time, I could load all four, A, B, C, and D at a time, and then do the two multiplies at the same time. But let's assume we can only do two things at a time, right? Two loads, well, three. Two loads, I can do two loads and a multiply at the same time. So I got two loads, then I got two loads and a multiply, and here's the multiply. So now I've cut this down from eight operations down to five. Okay? I've reduced the time cost. Now, again, there's so many lies embedded in this because Memory operations are way more expensive than at least adds and multiplies. They are way less expensive than like raising x to the y power where both of those are real. But for our purposes, this is all lies, but it's useful lies, okay? All right, so far so good? So I, I did manage on the one hand, I did manage to save us, oh, what was this? Uh, um, three out of eight, 37 and a half percent of the alleged runtime, right? So that's good. But that's not really where the big money is going to be. Because after all, these operations are taking, since it's a two gigahertz chip, these operations are taking um, maybe a few nanoseconds, right? So saving, shaving a few nanoseconds off my runtime, is that going to make a difference in real life, shaving off nanoseconds? How about if I shave off a few nanoseconds a billion times? Then is it going to pay for itself? Then it starts to pay for itself. So we get to loops. How many of you love loops? Hate loops. Do not have an emotional reaction to loops. Okay, I want you to love loops. Okay. So it turns out that instruction level parallelism is super valuable for loops. And the reason for this, we talked about this last time. So um, this is a logical way, here's the four fan version, here's the C version. This is a logical way to express how to do the same operation many times. Now I could randomly jump around in no particular order. We looked at that last time, but I'll get terrible performance for that. The reason I get terrible performance for jumping around at random is not that there's something inherently wrong with jumping around at random, but rather because this is the easy way to write the code, then therefore for a long, long time, in fact, even before there were high level languages, when people were marching from one end to the other of their 
arrays, and they wrote the code that way, then the people designing the hardware were like, oh, well, if they're going to write the code to march from one end of the array to the other, then we might as well make the hardware do that fast. So they made the hardware do that fast so that when you test your code on their hardware, you go, oh, their hardware is super fast. Let me buy a bunch of that, right? But then, of course, once they've set up the hardware and the compiler to be good at that, then you want to write your code this way so that your code runs as fast as possible. But of course, then once you, run, you write your code this way, then they have to make the hardware do this well. And this spirals up into the heavens, right? So there's always a compelling reason to do it this way, which is it will run faster because they designed the hardware to do this fast because that's what most people do in their code. That's how most people write their code, okay? All right, so I think I've already said that. It's also, when you, when you optimize something, it's handy to be able to predict in advance what's gonna happen. If you can predict in advance what's gonna happen, then you can do more tricks to get it to run faster. And we're gonna be exploring those tricks. Okay, so loops are good because they're very predictable. All right, so here is my, this is the C version. Here's the Fortran version. Um, so this is the code looping over the array and doing the z of i signed a of i times b of i plus c of i times b of i, right? Same thing in C or Fortran, doesn't really matter, okay? So here's my question to you. If I'm calculating z of zero, using a of zero, b of zero, c of zero, and b of zero, what effect does my calculation of z of zero have on my calculation of z of one? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No effect, right? Z of one, the way this code is written, Z of one is completely independent of Z of zero. They have nothing to do with each other. Well, if they're completely independent and have nothing to do with each other, could we do them at the same time? Ooh. And when we do things at the same time, when we do multiple things at the same time, that's called parallelism. Oops, that's the Fortran version. Okay, so how would we break this down? Well, when we're on iteration i for whatever value of i between, in this case, zero and length minus one, which is z, okay, when we're working on that, um, we're loading a of i into a register, and we're loading b of i into a register, and then we're multiplying. But while we're doing that, we're loading c of i into a register and b of i into a register, and we're multiplying. But while we're multiplying, notice we already have the rule, you can multiply while doing two loads. Right? By the way, and that is perfectly realistic. Okay. So, well, if you can multiply while you're doing two loads, why not multiply while you're doing two loads? Okay. So I'll be multiplying for, um, what would this be, um, C and D of I, while I'm loading into A of I plus one and B of I plus one into the registers that I already finished multiplying um, B of, A of I and B of I. Okay, and then while I'm adding those two products for index i, I can be loading for index i plus one, and so on. So if I can do multiple, yes, question for TV land. Does the number of cycles for an operation change with the gigahertz of the processor? Does the number of cycles for the operation change with the clock speed, the gigahertz of the processor? For most operations, the answer is no. For most operations, the time it takes to do a particular operation is expressed in cycles. There are some exceptions to that, but they are typically memory operations. Um, and we saw in the previous slide deck, in the um, storage tower slide deck, we saw a case where, or I think it was loading data from RAM on one of the CPU flavors, it was a number of cycles plus a number of nanoseconds. So. Um, there are operations that are nanosec expressed in nanoseconds, but not cycles or expressed in a combination of those, but almost all arithmetic operations are expressed exclusively in a number of cycles. Okay. Um, and so once we get going, we can speed up enormously. So now, once the whole thing is in flight, it actually only takes two operations per iteration of the loop instead of five or originally eight. So now we've sped up from the original by a factor of four. Again, this is all lies because the different operations take different amounts of time. I'm oversimplifying, but this captures the idea, okay? So 
a real example, and by the way, the, this information can be really, really hard to, to find, which is why I have an older chip that I'm expressing this way. Um, but this is the IBM Power 4. Yes, question from PB Lab. Everybody mute. If you're not sure whether you're muted, go mute. Somebody just came on board. Yes, mute yourself. Everybody in PV land must mute. So this is an older chip from the early 2000s, the Power 4. So at any given time, you could be doing two integer arithmetic or logical operations and or not, two floating point arithmetic operations, two memory operations, a branch, and a conditional, all at the same time. Now, the trick is you had to have all of this stuff happening in your math at the same time. That is, your loop had to have a lot of variety of what was going on. In it. Um, it's not necessarily trivial to write a loop that has all that good stuff in it, depending on what you're trying to calculate. So it becomes interesting, and we'll see this later, later on in the slides, it becomes interesting to look at um, how much you can stuff how many operations you can stuff into the body of the loop. All right, let's talk about pipeline. Okay, so this is the bucket brigade or the assembly line approach. Okay. So we're working on a particular set of operands. So index i, for example. Okay. But we can immediately start working on the next set of operands while we're still working on this set. And in fact, once we fill up the pipeline, depending on how deep the pipeline is, we can get a whole lot of different calculations going at the same time. Are you panicking? No panic. Okay. So here's a picture of that, um, which I stole from that reference there. Okay. So whatever the operation is that we're trying to do, whether it's an add or a load or whatever, there's stages that you have to go through to make that operation happen. Here's an example. This is a pipeline of depth five. You fetch the instruction, you figure out what it means, you fetch the operand, or in this case, the operands, you execute the instruction, and you send the result back to wherever it's supposed to go. Okay. Now, at the beginning of doing that loop, you fetch the instruction to work on um, iteration one. Okay. That happens at time zero. When you get to time one, one tick of the clock, when you get to time one, now you can be working on fetching the instruction for operand set two while you are decoding the instruction for operand set one. Then the next tick of the clock, you can be fetching the instruction for index three while decoding the instruction for index two while fetching the operand for index one. Then on the next step, you could be fetching the instruction for index one while decoding for index, sorry, index four, while decoding for index three, while um, uh, fetching the operand for index two, while actually executing the instruction for index one, and so on and so on and so on. So once you get going, the time cost of each iteration of the loop is one cycle. Now, not the literal time cost of getting that iteration completed, but the incremental time cost with respect to getting the whole thing done. So in this oversimplified version where the pipeline has these five stages, in this oversimplified version, it takes to do a thousand operands, to do index one through index a thousand, it takes a thousand and four cycles. Now, again, this is super oversimplified. Real life is much messier than that. But this gives the general idea. So now, where I used to take eight cycles to complete this expression that we were just working on, okay, now I'm doing it in one. So I got a factor of eight improvement. Okay. Again, I've massively oversimplified, but that gives you the idea. All right, so Haswell, which is the chip that we have on our supercomputer here at OU, Haswell. The pipeline is, is 14 to 19 stages long. So this obviously doesn't capture the whole thing, but having a nice deep pipeline means that I'm getting a lot of work done at the same time. In fact, I've got 14 to 19 calculations going on in the same moment. 
So here are some simple loops that we might pipeline. So adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing typically does not pipeline on most platforms today. Dividing will not pipeline. In fact, anything more complicated than add, subtract, or multiply, and there's a few others, um, the pipelines often do not work on. Adding stuff up is called a reduction. Reduction means turning many things into fewer things or one thing, in the case, right? So here I have many values in my array and I'm adding them up. Uh, a reason you might do that, for example, would be to calculate the mean of something because the mean is just you add them up and then you divide how, by how many there are. So in how many of you in real life have used the mean? Okay, so you would be using this reduction, reducing from many values down to, in this case, one, more broadly, um, fewer. Here's a few more. Uh, oh, this is the same thing, but in C, sorry. Same thing, but in C. Okay, so more complicated loops. Um, in Fortran, we actually have a raise to the power, uh, an X to the Y operator, which is the double star. Um, so this means source one of index raised to the power of source two of index. And as I said in our preview of coming attractions, that is on most platforms the slowest operation to do. So you want to avoid that if at all possible. Okay, modulus, um, so that's taking the remainder. Um, there's actually, a, and that will only work, by the way, on integer operands. Um, in the C version, it's actually an operator. So Fortran has an exponentiation operator, C does not. C has a modulus operator, Fortran does not. Okay, square root, cosine, exponentiation. So this is e to the x instead of um, y to the x. Log, as you may be aware, log in computer, in most computer languages, does not mean uh, common logarithm, does not mean base 10. Log typically means base e or natural logarithm. So it should have been named ln, but they didn't name it that. I don't know why. Okay, so there's the same thing in, in um, C. All right, so it turns out different operations take different amounts of time. And I mentioned that. So add, subtract, and multiply are super fast x to the y power, where both of those are non-integers, is super slow. Okay. And there's all kinds of stuff in between. And I'll show you a graph in a minute. Different processor types have different performance characteristics, um, different compilers. Uh, and in fact, um, even comparing int versus float, you can get, so integer versus real operands, you can get different performance profiles. Okay. Now, I realize you can't read down here what it says, but so that you know, this is all on the same hardware, but using different compilers with different levels of optimization. So how many of you have noticed when you use a compiler, there's hyphen big O? Has anybody used hyphen big O? What does hyphen big O mean? Yeah, it means run fast. The O is for optimize, okay? And you can even do like hyphen big O one and hyphen big O two. And hyphen big O one, means optimize some, and hyphen big O2 means optimize more, and hyphen big O3 means optimize even more than that. There are even compilers that have hyphen big O4. What do you suppose that means? Even more than three. So this is, and I'm not making this up, but it, and you can drill down into what it really means. You can go dig into the manual and find out specifically the things that are done at the various levels of optimization. But the way to think of it is the higher the level, the more it's doing to make the code run fast. Now, by the way, that sounds really attractive, doesn't it? So why would anyone ever use something other than hyphen big O, whatever the biggest optimization level is? It's what? You know, it used to be that compiles took a long time. I remember when I was a wee lad in grad school and I would start the compile going and then I basically could go get lunch before the compile would finish. But those days are over. Now, even if you've got a million lines of code, it's not going to take that long to, to compile the code. Code doesn't take nearly as long to compile as it used to. So that's no longer the issue. There's a much worse issue, which is the higher the level of optimization, the more likely it is that you are introducing exciting new bugs in the executable because of what's called aggressive optimization. Some optimization are not safe under certain circumstances. And so you will add bugs to your code if you aggressively optimize. So you have a hard choice to make. 
do I crank up the optimization level and the code runs faster, but then it might give the wrong answer? Or do I back off on the optimization so the code runs slower, but is more likely to give the correct answer? So how do you know what the right thing to do is? So I, I will give you the bad news. You don't. There is no way to know what the right thing to do is, except to test. And so what you do is you compile your code with optimization level zero, and you compile your code with each subsequent optimization level and see how much the results differ on some test problem that is typical of the kinds of problems you want to do. Is this like the compiler have the, the option to choose which level of optimization you want? Or do you have to buy a different, different compiler? So, so you have the ability to tell the compiler what level you want. You don't have the ability to ensure that it therefore does the right thing because um, all of this is more art than science. There is some science behind it, but there's a lot of art. And whatever choices the compiler makes, and by the way, the current version of the compiler is not necessarily making the same choices as the next version of the compiler. The, the choices the compilers make differ from version to version. The best solution I've ever seen is you try a typical problem in multiple at multiple different optimization levels and you compare the results and see at each level is it correct that is equal to the same the non-optimized version to within some tolerance to within some epsilon that you're willing to tolerate that's the best you can hope for and by the way that means you have to decide how much error you're willing to tolerate because a small amount of error is not a big deal but a large amount of error could easily be a big deal could be the difference literally between life and death, right? So how do you know? Well, the short answer is you can. Okay, so getting back to what I was talking about here. So here, um, these are, for example, add, um, and this is um, real and integer. This is sum, so calculate for all of the things in the same array, add them all up together. Subtract, notice that subtract looks an awful lot like add. Multiply, still looks pretty similar to add and subtract. Okay, uh, let's see, this is mod, here's divide, look how divide is not doing so great. Uh, power, raise this, raise this real number, this non-integer to that non-integer power. Look at the terrible performance there, it barely registers as performance at all. Um, a good rule of thumb, I can't remember which chip family I looked at, one of the chips I looked at, whereas add and subtract, A, take a few cycles, and B, can be pipelined. Um, Power, raising this to the that power um, for non-integers um, took about 250 cycles and was not pipelineable and was not vectorizable, which we'll get to. In a minute. So it'll always be terrible performance. So it was taking literally hundreds of times longer to raise x to the y power than it was to add a couple numbers or multiply a couple numbers together, which tells you, by the way, that if the power you're raising to is an integer, then just multiply by hand. We'll get to that next week. We'll see how the compiler is smart enough to figure that out for you. Okay, um, cosine e to the x. Uh, I can't even read. Oh, this is logarithm uh, and so on, right? Now, over here are calculations that I did where I put more and more operations inside the loop. So here I put eight operations inside the loop. These were all multiplies and adds, right? Maybe. Here I put 10 operations, 12 operations, 16, 20. Here I put 20 four operations inside the same loop. Okay. And again, these are different compiler families at different optimization levels. And you can see that as I stuff more junk into the loop, inside the loop body, I get better performance. More things happen at a time because I give the compiler more stuff to do. Okay. So that's good. All right, so super fast, sum, add, subtract, multiply, medium, divide, uh, modulus is basically the same operation as divide. Um, in fact, in most CPUs, when you divide, it actually takes, it has two results. It has, when you do an integer divide, it has two results. One result is the quotient um, and the other result is the remainder. Okay. And so the divide um, operation ignores the remainder. The remainder operation ignores the quotient. Square root, that's a fun one. 
Um, Transfound functions tend to be very slow. And then of course, x to the y for non-integer x and y is ridiculously slow. So if you have calculations that can be expressed primarily as adds, subtracts, and multiplies with a minimum number of divides or worse, then you can get very, very fast. So solving a system of linear equations, for example, is almost entirely adds, subtracts, and multiplies. And there's a very modest number of divides. So if you've got an n by n matrix, so n squared data, it takes n cubed operations. We saw that last week. But because uh, essentially how you solve a system of equations is morally equivalent to how you multiply. I'm down to 10 minutes, 15 minutes. OK, great. I'm, I'm nowhere near ready, but that's fine. OK. Um, uh, but in any case, so n cubed adds, subtracts, multiplies but only n divides. So it can run quite fast because the divides don't really contribute much to the total run time. Okay, so what prevents pipelining? What do you want to avoid in order to get good performance? You want to avoid jumping around in the array, right? We saw that last week. When you jump around in the array, things are slow because of the memory issue because you're not getting any reuse of the cache line you drew, drew in, but they're also slow because of no pipelining. I said the more calculations we could put inside the loop, the faster it ran, right? The problem is that's only true up to a point. Okay? At some point, you have so much junk inside the loop body that the compiler throws up its hands and says, I don't know what to do. And then it runs slow. It falls back to the unoptimized version. Is that good or bad? How do you know whether to add more junk into or have less junk inside the loop? Let me ask the question differently. Can you know? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No, you can't. So you can test it. You can say, well, if I do the code this way or I do the code that way, what happens? What's the difference in performance? You can test it. But will the test that you do today on this hardware with this version of the operating system and this version of the compiler, will that test match the test you do next week on a different platform? A different answer. So again, you have to take your best guess and hope. That's the best we can ever offer you. Okay. If you put if statements inside the loop, now that's becoming less of a problem. Um, in fact, how many of you have heard of the meltdown uh, uh, hardware bug? Or I, sure, let's call it a hardware bug. Has anybody heard about this? It's a security vulnerability. It's a big deal. Okay, how many of you saw that we? Um, did a sudden maintenance outage on a Friday, uh, like three or four weeks ago. How many of you remember that? We did sudden maintenance outage. Okay, that was because there was a vulnerability discovered in certain x86 chips that if you tried to um, get around the problem of having if statements inside the loop, and there's a clever solution to get you to go faster, but the problem with that clever solution to get you to go faster was that miscreants could then use it to take over your computer. So that should make us frightened. So by putting in that patch that we put in in the sudden emergency maintenance, the flip side is that some codes run slower. Uh -oh. um, if you have something inside the loop that says, under certain circumstances, I will stop doing this loop, that's going to um, make pipelining very difficult, if not impossible to do because pipelining only works if you can predict what's going to happen. If there are calls to functions or subroutines, if you're going to have some kind of branch to somewhere else in the code, you're going to have a problem. And of course, IO, which is essentially a, a subroutine call, is going to kill it. Um, so I've already said all of this, I think. So um, random order, blah, blah, blah. Oh, right. So this was the thing I was talking about. So there's something called speculative execution. It takes time to evaluate the condition of an if statement, the thing in parentheses. It takes time to do that. While you're evaluating the condition, you can't be doing the calculations that you're supposed to be doing. Well, if you can't do the calculations you're supposed to be doing, then the pipeline stalls. And so compilers don't want to pipeline a loop that has an if inside it. But now most hardware will do what's called speculative execution. I will do both of the branches of that if. When, when the condition is true, I'll do that stuff. And when the condition is false, I'll do that stuff too until the condition is evaluated and I find out what the answer is. And then I'll stop doing the one I don't need. But while I'm waiting for the condition to finish evaluating, 
I'll go ahead and start doing both. Because I got all that extra circuitry inside the chip anyway. I've got super, uh, I've got super scalar, I've got pipelining, so I can get stuff done in the meantime. So speculative execution is a way to get around that. Another way to get around that is what's called branch prediction. I guess that most of the time this if condition will evaluate to true. So I'm going to go ahead and do the true thing. If I'm wrong, if it turns out to be false, then I'll stop doing the true thing and go do the false thing. That's another way to do it. So the simplest, and in fact, that is the simplest form of branch, of branch prediction is I'm going to guess that a condition will always be true. And I'll just, because most of the time it'll probably be true. So I'll just go ahead and assume it's going to be true until I discover it's not. Okay. And I already said all this stuff. So what happens if your pipelining is not working? What, what, what's the result of that? Code runs slow. Is that good or bad? Why is that bad? What is time? Time is money. Okay. All right. So what I did here was I'm comparing if I march from one end of the array versus if I jump around at random. So dark blue is march from one end of the array to the other. And this light sort of bluish teal that's if I jump around at random, 10 minutes. And, I, and you notice that jumping around at random is super duper slow. So the moral of that story is don't jump around at random um, because no matter what you do, and by the way, that's a combination of two effects. One of them is the memory thing, right? And the other is that you can't pipeline. Okay, now super pipelining, this is very simple. We had super scalar doing multiple completely unrelated operations at the same time. We had pipelining doing the same operation on many different operands at the same time. What do you imagine super pipelining is? Is there a question in TVLAN? No, okay. Um, super pipelining just means you have multiple pipelines. Okay. So you can get even more work done. Isn't that great? Of course, the flip side of this is that if you don't have enough junk for the machine to do inside that loop, then not much of what you could have got done is going to happen. So your percent of what we call theoretical peak speed, the fastest you could go, your percent of theoretical peak will be sad. OK. Um, so here's some complicated loops. This is called fuse multiply add. You sometimes see it as mad for multiply add. So I am multiplying this by something. And I'm adding that to the result as a single operation. And the reason that's popular is because it's useful for things like dot products. And that comes up a lot in real life. Um, here is, in fact, dot product, which under the covers, if you have a fuse multiply add operation in the hardware, under the covers, this will be done as a fuse multiply add where the multiplier is going to be one. Right? Um, here is. Uh, what would this be? Oh, just adding some stuff together, right? So we're multiplying. This was from our little example. Z is A plus B times Z times plus uh, B times D. That's basically the same thing. Uh, um, and this is Euclidean distance. So the distance between two points, um, you, you draw the line between and then follow the line. Okay, so that's that. Notice I've got square root in here, so that's going to inhibit pipelining. Okay, now this is the one that I called lot 24 in that other graph. And it was super duper fast in terms of calculations per second, right? And I had to work super hard to figure out how to get this to not have any common sub-expressions because one of the things that compilers do really well, and we'll talk about this next week, is they notice if the same sub-expression shows up multiple times in the same statement or even inside the same loop. And they say, oh, well, if you're going to do that multiple times, I'm not going to go to the trouble of calculating that multiple times. I'll just calculate the result. I'll stick it in a register, and I'll just use it when I need it. So I had to think really hard how to get this so that there were no overlapping expressions. That was not easy to do. Okay. And you can see, this is that thing with the 24 calculations in it, you get super duper good performance on it because there's so much work to do. So again, you don't have to do the instructional level parallelism, but you have to be aware of how it gets done in order to write the code in a way that can run fast. And here is the bad news about that. How many of you have ever taken a programming course? Okay. In your programming course, did they teach you the following? 
you make your pieces of data small and you do small things to them. So for example, you call some routine and they said, try and keep it certainly under 100 lines, ideally under 10. Keep it simple. And the reason they said to do it, and it's a really good reason, this is why we were taught this in our first programming course when we were we lads and lasses. The reason that we do it that way is because it makes debugging so much easier. Right? Yes, question from TV Land. What makes I4-02 what makes I4-02 such a good compiler? I'm not gonna answer that question because I am not allowed to endorse or to disparage any product, service, or firm. I, I'm a public uh, institution employee. Um, uh, all of the compilers are good and I'll leave it at that. Okay, what was I saying? Lost my train of thought. It was brilliant, I'm sure. Oh, right, right, yes, we write little routines on little pieces of data because it's easier to debug. And after all, bugs are bad, right? We don't want a lot of bugs. Okay. Problem with that approach is then you don't have enough for the compiler to chew on and the hardware to chew on. And so you get terrible performance, right? So the way you wanna write code to get good performance is literally the exact opposite of what we were taught when we were wee lads and lasses in our first programming course. You want to write big routines <laughs> on big chunks of data. Is that a question or five minutes? Okay. Yes, five minutes. Okay, great. I think I'm actually kind of sliding into home on this one. Yes, question. I guess, um, I feel like that person's question on the last one was probably more like the blue bars. Oh, why is this so much better than right. the others? In that sense better, so I don't need to be like. No, no, I can't answer that question without sounding like I'm endorsing some gotcha. product. Well then, how would you answer the question? Oh, then? how, how, how would you know which one to choose? Maybe that's a better. Yeah, how would you know which one to choose? Right, you would try them all. Okay. And by the way, I'm not kidding about that. So this actually recently came up. We had someone, someone who has done, it, it came up right after we did that emergency patch for that vulnerability. Um, we had someone who had been running the same code for a zillion years on multiple different platforms, including on our current supercomputer, which is Haswell, the, the chip family. Um, and, um, he was finding that suddenly it was running slower than it used to. So we said, well, why don't you go ahead and try the other compiler family? So he was running with one kind of compiler. I'm not gonna say which one. He's running with one family of compiler. He said, why don't you go as an experiment, try the other one, see what happens. So the one that he had been using had been consistently the fastest for a number of years. And that's why he was using it, okay? Both of them were commercial compilers. So I'm not gonna say which was which. The other one, he hadn't used for a while because he had gotten such good performance out of the one he was using. Well, he re-benchmarked under the new circumstances and he found that the other one was substantially better in the new circumstances. In fact, not only was it better in the new circumstances, it was better than the old one had been before we did the emergency patch. Okay. So the, the answer to the question, how do you know which is the right one, is you test them. And it's not enough to test them once. You have to be retesting them on a fairly regular basis. Anytime there's a major change to the operating system, if there's a new version of the compilers, either one, right? If you've got, and we, have, we support three families of compilers. If any one of them changes, you should rerun the horse race. So you probably want to set up a, a script that actually runs the horse race for you so that you don't have to do it by hand every time. But you do want to be running that horse race fairly often. Sometimes people refer to this as a bake-off, right? You want to have your bake-off with some regularity. Now, the problem with that, of course, is it's labor-intensive and it wastes your time because you could be running a real production job in the meantime. That's life. Okay. All right, so vectors. So vectors go way, way back. They go back to the 1970s, but they're now ubiquitous in virtually every chip family that's out there, x86, ARM, Power, Spark, you name it. They all have this capability. What they have is a register that's a super register. So that super register is big enough to hold multiple operand sets at the same time. So the, the biggest register you can get today in the x86 line, so the Intel and AMD chips, and there's, there's smaller manufacturers as well, the biggest register you can get today is 512 bits. A double precision floating point number is 64 bits. So one, two, three, four, six, five, five. So that's eight operand sets running at the same time. And you do the same operation 
on all eight operand sets at the same time. So you've got all of the A's, A1 through A8, are in register V1. And B1 through B8 are in register V2. And you say multiply V1 times V2. And what you get is eight products, right? So um, the, pr the products of, the, of A and B for indes indices one through eight. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what a vector register is. That's what a vector instruction does. It does the same thing on multiple operand sets. So here's a picture of that. Oh, look, it's even eight. Okay. Multiple operand sets. So here the calculation I'm doing is vector register zero gets vector register one plus vector register two. I'm just adding together. So you can imagine if you can vectorize your code, then you can get really good speed ups. But again, that requires you to write the code in a way that makes it easy for the compiler to vectorize. You don't say to the compiler, vectorize this loop. Well, there are ways to express that under certain circumstances. But in general, you, you typically will not write your code to literally say vectorize this loop. But you write the code in such a way that it's easy for the compiler to do that. This is sort of a lie, but it was true for a long time. In the olden days, if you wanted vectors, you had to buy extra hardware to stick inside your computer. And you could only buy it for certain kinds of computers. So you started with an expensive computer, and then you bought this expensive add-on to put on top of that. That changed in the 1990s, starting, I think, with the Pentium 1. Um, they had this thing called MMX, which was very small vectors. I think the vectors were of length two, and they were integer only. Are we out of time? Okay, I'll go a little over. And then there was XMM, and then they started having floating point vector instructions, again, of length two. I think that was Pentium 4 was where that first came up. Um, and it's been getting bigger and bigger since then. So now you can actually do, uh, let's see, so in Skylake, which is the latest server chip, and KB Lake has the same architecture, so it's basically behaves the same way. In Skylake, you have a vector of length eight for double precision, eight double precision operand sets. You can do a fuse multiply add as a vector instruction. And it actually has two fuse multiply add units. So you could be doing two fuse multiply add vector instructions at the same time for the high end version of Skylake. The lower end versions of it, the cheaper chips can only do one. But the high end can do two FMAs at the same time. So the peak number of calculations you can do per clock cycle per core is 32. 32 operations per clock cycle per core. What that means is if you've got a, well, let's see, the most they have is, is um, 28 cores on the Intel side. I, I can't do 28 in my head, so I'm going to do 16 because I know how to multiply powers of two. So if I've got two 16-core chips in the box, and they are two gigahertz chips, because, again, I know how to multiply by two. Um, and, and there's a lot of oversimplification I'm doing here. I, I'm not going to bother going into details, but it, it's all, it's twos all the way down. It's powers of two all the way down. Let's just say that. Okay. Then I can do, so I've got two chips, 16 cores each, that's 32 cores, and it's two gigahertz, so that's 64 core chip clock cycles, and then 32 calculations per clock cycle. So what was I at? I was already at 64 um, by, by 32. So that is what, 2000? Is that right? Did I get that right? Is that 2048? Yeah. So I can do two teraflops in a single box. Or another way to think of it is one teraflop per chip. If I can keep that chip fed and my RAM keep up. Anybody remember? Did my RAM keep up with my CPU? The answer is not even close. But if I can get the data I need into cache and then reuse them over and over, I get tremendous performance out of that chip. Unbelievable. OK, so this is a real example. It came from a real code. We simplified it a little bit. But this, you can see we're doing some multiplies. We're doing some subtractions. And there are a lot of different uh, pieces of data and so on. And then we have this other thing over here that does some more calculations. A lot of fun stuff going on. So I actually tried that. This was on a particular chip using a particular compiler and so on. But I gave it a shot. Um, and what I found was the more I broke this up, the slower it ran, the more I brought everything inside a single loop, the faster it ran until there was too much and then it started to get, to get worse. So if I had 
one loop, it was slower than two loops, but five loops were slower than one loop. Well, than one loop. Yeah. Sorry, five loops were slower than two. You can kind of see how messed up this is, right? It also depended on which compiler I used. Um, but the idea was there's an upper limit to how much you can shovel into that loop and expect it to keep getting faster. And that upper limit is not knowable in advance because it depends on which flavor of the hardware you're using, which compiler family you're using, which version of that compiler family you're using, what compiler options you turn on when you're compiling, and on and on and on. The day of the week, the color of your socks. All of these things affect the performance. Okay, the color of your socks does not. The day of the week does. How many of you believe me when I say the day of the week determines how fast your code runs? How many of you are skeptical? Okay, let me ask you a question. On Monday, there's a ton of high energy physics jobs which don't use the interconnect at all. They are purely single core jobs. Or in some cases nowadays, they are single node, but still not doing multi-node. They don't use the interconnect. They don't use the network at all. On Tuesday, you've got a big weather forecasting job running that's chewing up the network. Will that affect your performance on your jobs? So the day of the week, I don't mean it's always faster on Monday than on Tuesday. I mean, there's so much randomly going on on the supercomputer on a given day. Unless you can afford your own supercomputer, which you can, <laughs> unless you can afford your own supercomputer, every day is different. And so whatever benchmark testing you do on Monday may not really apply as much on Tuesday. So can you get the right answer? Can you come up with the right way to get your code to run fast? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No, you can't. You can take a best guess. But anything beyond that is pure dumb luck. Right? You can get reasonably fast. The irony of the word optimize, which is the word we use in the supercomputing business to meet, which means make it run as fast as possible. The irony of the word optimize is that there is no way to know whether you have optimized. You can know whether it runs faster than previous runs. You can't know whether that's just today or will still be true tomorrow. No way to know. So what must you do? Test and hope. You do the best that you can with the information you have. In real life, do you ever have all the information you need to make a decision? No. In fact, in real life, you generally have no information. Or the information you have is either nonsensical or you don't know what you can rely on. Regardless, you better have an answer by Tuesday. And it better be right. How many of you have experienced this already? It doesn't matter that you don't have the information you need to make the right decision. It still better be right. Or you're fired. Right? This is life. Okay. All right. So, wow, we finished it. Nice. Okay. And we only went a little over. What time is it, actually? We only went seven minutes over. I'm patting myself on the back now. All right, so thank you, everyone. Come back next time, and we'll do stupid compiler tricks. It'll be a lot of fun.